Wolverine number 5 seemingly settles the first battle between Wolverine and Dracula's Vampire Nation before the Ten of Swords event, with Wolverine pretty readily outwitted at every turn. Today I'll answer, what's happening in the Dawn of X Wolverine's first story arc in Wolverine vs. the Vampires? What's the history of Dracula and the X-Men? And how does Wolverine connect to Jason Aaron's ongoing Avengers series and what Dracula's been doing there? Hey, I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. You are listening to Crack and Krakoa number 81. If you like the Comic Book Herald YouTube channel or podcast, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. It goes a long way to helping the channel and helping me out and encouraging me to make more of these Crack and Krakoa videos. Spoilers for Discuss Comics, including Wolverine number 5, will follow. So, writer Ben Percy, artist Victor DeBogdanovich, colors by Matthew Wilson, letters by Corey Pettit. Wolverine number five begins where issue number four left off. If you remember, it was only a couple weeks ago now, Wolverine was trapped in a big old block of ice after being accosted at a what he thought was going to be a friendly bar, and he was apprehended by Omega Red, who, as we know, is working at the behest of Dracula. And what we learn in Wolverine number five is that Dracula and his, uh, you know, vampire minions, they have Wolverine. Wolverine encased in a block of ice, and they are draining him of his blood, using them to make what they're calling blood clocks, which allow them to walk in daylight. So one of the properties of Wolverine's blood that Ben Percy has really been digging into kind of the scientific aspects of Wolvie's blood here is that his his incredible healing factor and all the immortality that it grants him, it can be used by uh, vampires as blood that they can consume to allow them to actually walk in the daylight, which of course helps them enact their plans. So Wolverine, it allows them, you know, extra plotting that they would not otherwise be able to accomplish, not being able to move in the daylight. And we know their schemes, of course, are bigger than just Wolverine, right? Going all the way back to earlier this year, in Wolverine number one, we've seen that the vampires in Dracula have their sights set on Krakoa in particular, right? So like they, there's some plot here that Dracula has in the vampires, and we don't get a lot of detail as to what it actually is, but at the very least, they have an eye on keeping Krakoa out of their business. We also know that uh, Dracula has Omega Red working as a spy of his. This has not yet been uh, revealed to Krakoa, but Omega Red has been allowed onto the island despite Wolverine's, you know, protests and objections, and he is very much working for the Lord of the Vampires, or so it seems. Now, what do we know of their plan so far? Well, frankly, not a whole lot. Uh, we learn in this issue and also in a letter that Wolverine writes to Luis, this vampire hunter that he met in the earlier part of the series, that the vampires are using their ability to walk in daylight to a degree to uh, essentially they are raiding northern towns. They are raiding more isolated towns throughout America and Canada and, and Europe, of course. They're based in Chernobyl is where Dracula's you know, home base is right now, Vampire Nation. And they are then spreading their, their armies, essentially, of vampires across cities. So we see them uh, dispersed in Minneapolis, Minnesota, for example, in this issue. So vampires are spreading, and they are trying to obviously create, the more vampires they create, the larger their army is. And one of the big things here that vampires are working towards is like, you know, coming out of the shadow of, of human rule, right? So it's actually interesting, I think, and we're going to talk about this, the similarities between what vampires are trying to avoid and what mutants are trying to avoid on Krakoa. So in this issue in particular, Wolverine is rescued from his frozen blood bag prison by some punk rebel vampires, but really Dracula and crew, they, they let him escape to avoid the full wrath of Krakoa because they know if they keep uh, Wolvie on ice for their own purposes at this point in time, that eventually is going to lead to all-out war with Krakoa having taken one of their own, obviously Wolverine being a crucial part of the X-Men and of mutant kind, um, and they're not ready for that. So they're, the vampires are still early enough days that they don't actually want to engage in war with Krakoa at this point, although it's alluded to that perhaps they will in the future. Ben Percy, I think, does a really great job drawing similarities between vampires and Krakoa, as I mentioned. Uh, there's immortality, right, of vampires, and then the resurrection protocols of Krakoa. Those are very similar properties. And, and Wolverine sort of thinking through this as well, just this idea of like, okay, you feel invincible now. What does that mean? How does that change how you behave? He kind of sees it as something where, you know, bad bad faith actors will act even worse, and, and good faith actors will, will act even better with the time that they're now given. Uh, but the other piece that he doesn't really talk about here is that both vampires and mutants are hated by humans, right, in some regards, um, and in kind of in different ways, but they do actually share this, uh, you know, persecution of sorts, <laughs> again, which is a weird, weird way to be talking about Dracula, who is, let's make no mistake, he's a fun monster, but dude's a monster. 
monster, right? He, he preys on humans and, and women in particular. So I think one thing that's interesting, given these similarities, is there's potential here. There's more potential here for them to recognize their similarities than there is, uh, to me, to have kind of an all-out war against. So I'm going to get to that as we talk about this a little bit more, some theories about where Dracula and company might be going. So what is Dracula's game? To answer that, I think it helps to look at the character's history a little bit with the X-Men and his standing in the broader X-Men universe, in the Marvel universe. So Dracula has an interesting Claremont era, so like early 80s uh, in these particular issues, history with the X-Men. Stories ranging from like trying to make Storm his bride, it happens in uh, Chris Claremont, Bill Sienkiewicz issue, Uncanny X-Men number 159, uh, to things like making Kitty Pride his daughter, for example. In, uh, in one of the Uncanny X-Men annuals. We know, too, from the Apocalypse vs. Dracula mini that is more recent, that Dracula's affairs with mutants extend hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, the series isn't particularly good. Uh, it's only four issues, but it is, you know, it is interesting to at least consider the idea that Apocalypse and Dracula would have had showdowns in the past. Long story short, you know, there's plenty of bad blood here, pun absolutely fully intended. I think it's interesting to think back, too, to, like, some more modern stuff, like 2010's Curse of the Mutants, where it's an event that begins with the death of Dracula, and the plan is generally to make, the plan of the vampires, is to make an army of, of vampires, uh, mutant vampires, excuse me, because then they'd have the power to be absolutely unstoppable. So, like, the vampire plan here is if we get mutant power sets added to our vampires, you know, we can have this forced alliance where now vampires can rule the Earth, which is pretty much always kind of their goal. That arc concludes with Cyclops and the Utopia X-Men actually resurrecting Dracula to protect their own borders, despite what they know of him, despite knowing of him as, you know, an out-and-out -out villain, and actually working with Blade in his complete objections to this, and then convincing Dracula when he decides, like, okay, I've helped you in, you know, by default because I needed revenge on the Draculas who usurped me, but now I'm going to take over your island nation of Utopia, and Cyclops, whether he's bluffing or not, tells him, you know, they had his body when they were resurrecting him for 17 hours, of course they'd have a contingency plan in place. And this is at least enough of a threat to get Dracula to back off in that moment. But it's something that kind of lingers, I think, and is interesting to consider that this still might be something that could get called back to. Whether it's in the pages of Wolverine or elsewhere in X-Men, the mutants might actually have a contingency plan still in place with Dracula that has not been revealed. So now, compound all this with what we've seen from Dracula and his vampire nation in the pages of the Jason Aaron written Avengers run. Uh, there's definite overlap here, I think, between Vlad's plans, you know, for, for Vampire Nation and the Avengers getting in his way. And I think it's Avengers like 13 to 18 would be my guess. Um, it's a Vampire Nation arc, it's third story arc in the Jason Aaron Ed McGinnis run. And, you know, there's there's a the Blade's a part of the Avengers now, right? They have a vampire threat on the rise. Plus, in Avengers number 32, we get kind of all the villains, like considering teaming up all the, the Avengers big bads that have been in, in this arc, and a particular focus on Namor, who is obviously a really interesting character in the world of House of X, Powers of Ten, Hickman era X-Men. And in this issue in particular, uh, Avengers number 32, Namor uh, makes contact with the Phoenix. So we've got Dracula crossover, we've got Namor with the Phoenix, right? There's a lot of ways here that this series could kind of spill across from Avengers to X-Men. For me, I think one of the things to really consider here is, you know, in particular to Dracula, and that's where we're going to focus, and with the X-Men, the idea of a Dracula vampires invading Krakoa war seems a little too easy. Um, it seems a little too obvious in kind of what we would have seen in the past, right? Like, that's basically what Curse of the Mutants is. Vampires infect Jubilee. They turn her into a vampire. That's when that happens. Um, and then, obviously, like, they try to take over Utopia. So, it, in tr the the you know, kind of the idea, this philosophy of breaking the rules of X-Men stories, which is kind of what makes the Hickman era so interesting, so exciting. And that's what Moira and Charles are trying to do. Breaking the rules, to me, would be like, Krakow is in the business of pharmaceuticals. Why couldn't the scientists on this island and then the big thinkers manufacture Wolverine's blood for vampires to gain their alliance? Like, why does he have to be in an ice blood bag prison as opposed to just getting this blood in a lab and figuring out what is the pharmaceutical solution here to get this blood as a new drug they can now market specifically to vampires in the same way they're marketing their Krakoa flowers to humankind to gain alliances there. To me, it seems like another way, very much the same way that we have an X-Men brood alliance per X-Men number eight and number nine, where, where Brew became king of the brood or, or whatever it is exactly. And we have this longtime X-Men enemy as an ally 
of the X-Men. That's a new look, right? That's a new thing that maybe changes the rules, that maybe changes the game. For Moira's long-term plan, I think you could do the exact same thing with the vampires as opposed to a Krakoa invasion. And I'd be very interested to see what that looks like because I, I would consider here... Yes, vampires have, you know, in Dracula specifically, have historically been X-Men villains, but so has, you know, 50% of the island at this point, right? The villains are welcome. So why couldn't there be an alliance with a vampire nation? In the same way that, I mean, humankind is, is of a part, enemy to the X-Men, right? Humans are those who make sentinels, and sentinels are those that wipe out mutant kind. So making an alliance with, with vampires is not necessarily something that doesn't work in this era of X-Men. I think it actually works quite well. So in conclusion, I do quite appreciate the post-credits teaser of Wolverine wanting to go uh, vampire hunting, but getting pulled off-world via some sort of rainbow transport. Now, we know the next issue is a Tennisworks crossover. We know that's where the X-Line is heading. So all implications are that this is a post credit sting for uh, where Wolverine's going to be in Tennisworks. I do have to call out, though, like he's clearly pulled by a big rainbow, and Often in Marvel, if you see a rainbow, that is a reference to the Rainbow Bridge of Asgard, uh, which now Lady Sif controls, fully uh, fully adorned with Galactus if you're reading Thor. So it, this Rainbow Bridge coming down, I mean, it would be surprising to me if Asgard had anything to do with Ten of Swords. Um, but I do, you know, I do expect the, the X-Men and Wolverine to be like dimension hopping. So is it possible that one of the dimensions where Wolverine needs to go begins in Asgard? That would actually be really interesting. Um, again, it's not something I expect, but that was something that popped into my head here. So what do you think about all this? What do you think is the big plan of Dracula? Where is this Vampire vs. Krakoa showdown going? I'm curious to hear it as well as if you are digging Wolverine uh, as a whole, you know, where it stands in the Dawn of X. I think it's a, I think Percy's been doing, uh, I like the work he's doing, honestly, across the Dawn of X line. I like Wolverine. Um, I like X-Force a bit more, you know, the series that is kind of integrated and they're, they're tied in in ways you don't necessarily have to read both, but I do think it benefits to read both um, if you're enjoying the work. So it, it's been good, not my favorite stuff, but like good, like solidly right in the middle. Um, so let me know what you think. Let me, let me know some new X-Men theories that you got. And, uh, and let's keep talking comics here on Kraken Krakoa. So thanks to everybody who supports Comic Book Herald. You can go over to patreon.com slash comic book herald if you are so inclined. Uh, for as little as $1 a month, you can chip in, and that is greatly, greatly appreciated. In particular, I'd like to thank those uh, mysterious benefactors who support the site at the $10 a month tier, which is extremely generous. Thank you, Jeff Zacharias, Ron Paul Kirkley, Jesse W., Robert Mickelson, Professor Pride, Steve Brennan, Cole Weathers, Martin Lopez, Chris Isidro, and Darren Clark for all of your support. Again, I'm Dave. You can find my stuff at comicbookherald.com, including you know reading orders for The Hold On of X, reading orders for Wolverine, whatever you're looking for. And I'm at Comic Book Herald pretty much anywhere online. So thanks, everybody, for listening. And as always, enjoy the comics.